Okay, so, where's your sound kit? You know what's going to happen? Hey, you ready? Sound in? Yeah. Let, let me know when you're ready and I'll try it. You ready? Hold it. Do you see it? I was reluctant to do that. There's mine. There's his. Yep. That's fine. So we'll just do a little Thanks, Roland. Loving your flex. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the worst thing to do as a project manager? Thanks. <laughs>
Yeah. No, they want them all. Oh, want them all. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks very much for coming out. Ooh. <laughs> I like that. Makes me sound like I'm in a much bigger, uh, much bigger hall. Um, welcome uh, to the uh, uh, to the LRT uh, introduction session. My name is David Wojcik. I am the president and CEO of the Mississauga Board of Trade. Uh, my colleague from Brampton, Todd Letts. Uh, was not able to uh, be with us today, but he did uh, ask me that I bring along greetings from the Brampton Board of Trade. So welcome to the members of the Brampton Board of Trade, the Mississauga Board of Trade, our guests, and, uh, uh, and it's, it's really good for of you to, uh, to take some time out of your day and come and learn about this incredible project uh, that will be running uh, up and down here on Ontario Street. Uh, we've been a big supporter of the of the LRT. Uh, some people have said, well, you know, we don't need it now, and maybe we don't need it now. But uh, 10, 20 years from now, uh, people will be uh, commenting on how wonderful it is. I've said myself, you know, a, a stale, pale male like myself, I'm not going to abandon my car to get on the LRT and go to square one. But certainly my, uh, my daughters will, that generation, the generation after, they will absolutely be abandoning their cars. And as the, as the uh, Highway 10 corridor expands and uh, more and more people live, work and play up and down that corridor, we'll see this LRT become more and more important to the transit infrastructure of Peel Region. So we have two uh, incredible speakers with us, which I'm going to get to the introduction uh, in, uh, in just a moment. You have some uh, paper in front of you there, which uh, we would ask that you write your questions down on that. And uh, those questions will be handed to our, our speakers. Uh, I'm not sure, is Jody, is, who's going to collect the paper? Who's going to collect the questions? You're going to collect the questions? Absolutely. Uh, so I do want to give a, uh, a little bit of a shout out to the two people that have been instrumental in, uh, in working with Metrolinx to put these information sessions together. Uh, that is the, uh, the project lead, Jody McDonald, who likes to remain in the background, and, uh, and our director of government relations, Brad Butt. Uh, those two people have been absolutely hard at it working with Metrolinx to put these uh, sessions together, which will continue for the next several months. We are live streaming uh, this, uh, this event, so uh, if uh, you were supposed to be someplace else today and you don't want to be on camera, you may want to uh, try and avoid the cameras as you see them here. But if you were supposed to be here, then that's fine. You can uh, jump in front of the cameras at any time. Our first presenter today is Roland Stanley. He's the general manager for Urban Strategy. Uh, Roland has worked in four major metro areas in North America in urban, suburban, and rural environments and uh, distressed and booming urban areas. He runs the Urban Strategy Development, uh, sorry, the Urban Strategy Department for the City of Calgary, looking at major plays and identifying strategic city building opportunities. Previously, he worked in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., the city of St. Louis, and right down the street here in Toronto. Our second presenter is uh, Darshpreet Badi. Uh, Darshpreet is the project director for the Here Ontario LRT. To this position, uh, Darshpreet brings strong leadership and transit experience from various private and public sector positions. Immediately before joining the LRT team, he was the director of rapid transit at the region of Waterloo, where he was responsible for planning, engineering, constructing, operating, 
and maintaining the ION light rail and bus rabbit transit project. You were a busy guy over there. Previously, he worked on a wide variety of transportation projects in different roles, including the TTC, St. Clair Streetcar, Ottawa North South LRT, Toronto Waterfront Revitalization, and the Highway 407 Extension. Darshpreet is a graduate with a degree in applied science from the University of Toronto. He grew up in Mississauga. Not sure why he didn't go to the University of Toronto, Mississauga, but that's okay. We won't hold it for, get that against him. And he lives in, has lived in Brampton for the past 11 years. Please give a warm round of applause for both of our presenters. And now it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome to the podium your first presenter from Urban Strategy, the General Manager, Roland Stanley. Thank you, well, thank you everybody, and thanks to uh, the two boards of trades for having me here today. As you heard, I've worked in Toronto for 21 years, I worked for the Mayor of St. Louis for six, and I worked on the, the good side of the Potomac River, uh, Maryland, not the lawless land over in Virginia where all the defense contractors are. <laughs> where we did a lot of transportation work, so and now in Calgary. So I'm going to be using examples from these areas. Unfortunately, we had some problem with the video uh, for the sound, so my humor is not going to be in the presentation. But maybe I'll try and do my best Christopher Walken imitation when it comes up. <laughs> so I'm going to try and cover a lot of ground here today, talk about what happens through different experiences, particularly Kansas City, who just opened up their light rail, and I think you'll find it informative. So you had light rail out here a long, long time ago. And it, it was, in fact, in 200 cities across North America. And what happened, do you all know the story about General Motors and Firestone Tires? Did you ever see the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Yeah. <laughs> That's what happened. They bought up all the streetcar systems, tore them all out, and then did what? Sold them GM buses with Firestone Tires, for which they were fined $2,500. And of course, now what we see is all across America, North America, we're spending billions to put transit systems back in. So you're not alone. So this video, unfortunately, won't play. That It's the same guy who narrated all the videos in the 1940s. It's really great. But I'll send you a link. You can watch it on YouTube. So I just wanted to get, do some stats about Mississauga and Brampton when I get started here and talk about who's commuting by car as a driver, car as a passenger, public transit. They walked. That's pretty low. Uh, bicycle, you got to have good eyesight, <laughs> and other, there's actually more than, well, a little more than a uh, bicycle. And so what you're looking at here is an opportunity to improve some of these modes of how people get to work. And certainly when you look at the Here Ontario Corridor, the opportunity really does exist. So what's the role of the streetcar? Support local business, encourage growth along the corridor. It's pretty much all the things you've heard. And the thing is, it actually does work. Who rides them? And I want to come back in the next slide to all-purpose riders. One of the things, when you look at transit systems in a lot of places, in the morning, the vehicles are loaded going in one direction and not in the other. So you want to try and create a double flow, and you want that flow to be happening all the time. So it's not just during the peak periods in the morning and the evening rush hour. And so when you look at all-purpose riders, currently across North America, 49% of the people use transit to get to work. 21% used for shopping trips, 17% are recreational, and, and in the uh, multiple purposes in the off-peak hours, you're trying to drive these two factors so that you have a greater utilization. And in fact, this is what really interests the businesses. And when is the parking lots the busiest at retail stores? On Saturdays. And a lot of this experience is also true with transit. Don't do what we did when we opened up our last rail line in Calgary. This is a light rail line leaving the downtown in Calgary. And the one thing you can't do after you put in the light rail in these areas is go back and rezone them for greater density. Because now the people living in the single family homes have their transit system and they don't want anybody else there. And it becomes a big, big difficulty. And I'll get back on this subject because there's lots of opportunity in your corridor to bring a lot more people in. And it's too hard to do after you've built it. So, transportation and demographics. This is actually really funny. And that's Christopher Walken on Saturday Night Live, and he's being interviewed for the census. And he's saying, uh, we're interviewing for the census. You didn't fill out your form. How many people live in your condo unit? And Christopher Walken goes, geez, 80. And the other guy goes, 80 people live in this apartment? He says, seems high. How about four? And it's actually very funny. 
But when you start to think about it, and the demographics, the next few slides of what I'm about to show you is what is really important when it comes to building your transit system. So let's look at a couple of things. Between 2006 and 11, and then the last five years, you're averaging in about 5.5%. Mississauga, you were doing quite well in the five years leading up to uh, 2011, but it's dropped off quite a bit since then. But look at Brampton. It's like busting the ceilings. It's really, really growing. And when you start to think about that growth, you have to think about the age groups, okay? And who's coming in? And this is important for transit and so many other things. So, population, the percent of your population aged 0 to 14, look at Brampton, Calgary, Mississauga sort of middle of the pack. That's a good base because these kids are going to fill the schools that you built and hopefully be paying for all of this as we get older. And this is the thing that scares Canada. This is the thing that terrifies Germany. This is the thing that terrifies China, which is why they changed their one-child policy. The growth in the population over the age of 65. And there's Mississauga, 14% growth recently. Brampton's not doing too bad with Calgary down here at 11. But when you look at what happens over time, the numbers shoot through the roof. So Canada, Mississauga, Brampton, age groups, 0 to 14, Mississauga is not doing well. 15 to 24, wow, look at Brampton. It's, it's really something else. These are the kids that are finishing school and will be going into the workforce. But look at this, 65 uh, and over. It's also a very serious thing for Brampton because you have an aging population. I'll be there soon. And I'm not insulting older people, but you don't pay as much taxes when you're older as you did when you were working. And so that's a challenge for the country, it's a challenge for cities, it's also a challenge for mobility. Because you don't want me driving a car when I'm 77. Mm -hmm. Particularly in the kind of environment we have here. You need to provide options for people to age in the same place. And if you have a transit system, it means I can downsize from my single family home, which we'll get to in a moment, move into a condo or a senior's residence and have access so that I don't have to drive. And that's a big thing for Brampton. It's a big thing for Mississauga, it's a big thing for the country. So, and remember this guy, that's what we're doing it for. The older people and the guy with the tattoos, and by 2025, 75% of the college graduates will have MBAs. How do they want to live? How do they want to get around? So, also important, it goes back to the age. What percent of your housing stock is single family houses? Well, Calgary, we're off the charts. It's many people we put downtown in the last 15 years, it's still very much a single family community and our growth boundaries we don't have them, we're growing out and out and out and trying to intensify. Brampton, same boat. Mississauga is actually, here's where Mississauga is doing really well. And why is this important? Because the turnover in single family homes as we get older has a real impact on your school system and your transit system. Because where I was living in Washington DC, eight houses sold in my street in five years. Those houses didn't have kids in them for about 30 years. And then all of a sudden families moved in and the school board didn't know what to do with all the kids. And what does that mean? So in Calgary, we've worked out by 2030 what kind of change we need in our housing stock in the downtown area. We need a lot less single family homes. We need more grade related townhouse units and more apartments, condo type buildings. And that increases as you move away from the downtown area, particularly as you saw with all the single family houses in Brampton. And so what do we see? Apartments. The percent of your housing stock with apartments over five stories. Mississauga is doing pretty darn good. Of course, Toronto and Vancouver are a different story, right? But Mississauga is doing very well. Calgary is not. Although right now we have a surplus, but our population is going back up again. We were growing by 40,000 a few years ago and then fell off the cliff when the oil boom hit or crashed. Brampton definitely needs more. And when you look at the ownership pattern in, in, in the homes, this is reflective of the single families again. But this Mississauga number, 72% of the people own their own homes, that's really quite good. But a lot of those people will be looking to sell those places and downsize. Oh yeah, very important. Multi-generational households, which you see a lot of in Brampton, and you have high, high greater household sizes, and we heard in the introduction, where did he go? that he doesn't take the train to square one, but the kids do. And so when you're looking at the multi-generational households, you've got to provide transit to the number of people in that household to get to where they want to go. 
So, uh, got a couple things here in stats. Because now I want to talk about some examples of where they've done this. And we'll go to Portland to start. In Portland, after they put in the train, within two to three years, they had a 35% increase in the commercial development, they had a 41% increase in the residential development, and the condo prices went through the roof. But only within a certain distance of the transit. The farther you got away from the transit, the prices stabilized. And they didn't seem the same increase, but they were still within walking distance. And then you also look at, we got 2,000 new units in 2015 with an affordable housing component. They're expecting 6,000 units. And last year, the ridership was going through the roof. They got a 10% increase and went up to 16,000 riders. And their headways aren't that fast. So all along the street, they're seeing the kind of development that I think you might want to see along here in Ontario. And that was a direct result of the train. Now, they were very focused on how they did the construction. And in Portland, they only did it two blocks at a time so that they could keep the roads and access to the stores open. Very, very important. In Portland, they're looking at how many new businesses came in off the charts. Those increases, I, the actual numbers, 860 new businesses fronting on the streetcar, 40 new coffee shops, how many do you need? Apparently a lot. 123 new restaurants, 207 new retail stores, in addition to the businesses that were already there. Now, DART is Dallas Area Rapid Transit. Very comparable situation to what we have here because they were extending rapid transit into the suburbs. And that's where it really made a difference in Dallas because they started focusing on the stops, or started focusing on the transit stops, and things boomed. The all kind of uh, property values went up, generated a huge increase in property tax. They uh, did the expenditures about the economic impact and wages and things like that, and it's been a huge boom for the Dallas area. This is a picture in Toronto, or sorry, out my window. This is the new public library in Calgary. There's the light rail coming in, it goes like this. All the trains meet just beside City Hall, and the area is just booming around it. Everybody wants to be near the train. And in fact, just over here is a condominium with 167 units with no car parking. Zero. You walk into the basement and there's a massive bike parking garage. And you get two spots, one on the bottom, you pull out a rack on the top, put your bike in and lock it up, and you get a bike when you buy the condo. When it went on sale, uh, all of the units sold out in a weekend except, uh, I think, 10. But it works because it's right where the train is. And plus, when you're looking at affordability, now you're not paying. Calgary's the most expensive in Canada for concrete, by the way. We're about 15 to 25 percent more expensive than Toronto. So our underground spaces are about 55,000 a spot. So by not providing the garage, you've just lowered the price of the units dramatically. Hey, there's sound. Kansas City. Just finished it about a year and a half ago. And this is a really interesting study about what they did. They used to have the street scars. They, stole, they took them out. Now they want to have an extended. It's been so excessive. Their short loop, it's only a couple miles long. They've already realized it's done $1.8 billion in economic activity. There's 40 new projects along there. And their sales tax receipts have gone up 58%. Uh, I'm Canadian, but I worked in the States for 10 years. As a little aside, we need to have this conversation in Canada. Because uh, when you establish a half cent sales tax for a special purpose in the States, you generate a lot of revenue. And so what they spent a lot of time doing was looking at informing everybody during the construction. And so in Kansas City, they kept one lane of traffic open the whole time. They built pedestrian bridges across the construction so people could get from one side of the street to the other to patronize the businesses. They put their deeps and shallow utility coordination in really fast, so there was minimal disruption. They have someone you can call 24 hours a day during the construction if you have an issue. And they had a whole parking strategy about how they could make sure people could still park at the businesses if they wanted to get there. So what you can't see there, it says zero businesses were lost during the construction period. Nobody lost their business. They had constant door-to-door -door engagement. You could pick up your phone and find out what was happening at any point. What was coming next, what they were planning, when they were having meetings, etc. Constant uh, lunch and learns, and they tested the system overnight, so it didn't disrupt. 
They had events, constant events, parties, the first station opened up, this milestone. They had street parties, they had monthly points awards where people could get points for shopping at local businesses. And they had a big event on the first Friday of every month where they just invited the whole city to come down into the business community and see what was going on. Uh, and critical and, and, and so good about what you're doing here in here Ontario is when you drive here in Ontario, just like in Kansas City, you look at the things that you're connecting and the things that you're, you're, you're going past. Those major east-west roads are real barriers to people crossing. I mean, would you want to be walking across there today, right? The transit system gets you across those barriers and opens up new opportunities for businesses to uh, get more customers. They did a small business survey after the station opened to find out how did businesses fare during the construction and what was the impact. And they found out, did you feel prepared? High number felt prepared because they were informed. They had a lot of consulting going on about how you could contend with this, how you operate your business during the construction period. Does the growth in the downtown business over the past year, is it noticeable? 41%, 22% were moderate or absolutely yes. I noticed an impact, a high impact, slightly lower at 34%, but basically nobody said they lost business. And that's why zero businesses went bankrupt during the construction and now they're seeing more business. Have you seen a change in revenue? 15% said yes, 16 to 30% uh, in this category now. They do see a difference. People are coming down. Have you seen a change in foot traffic? Yes. Everybody has seen it. When I would go home to, to, to the beaches in Toronto, where I lived for 21 years, I'd be taking, I stopped taking the subway. I'd take the streetcar. If I wanted to go grocery shopping or pick up food, I'd just get off the train. Now, the, I just understand, I heard from Brad this morning, that like most transit systems, the TTC is going to allow you to do that and not have to pay to get back on if you do it within a certain period of time. That's a big boom for businesses, because now you can get off, get the milk, go get some prepared food, jump back on within a certain period of time, you don't have to pay again. That's really positive for business. What time of day do you see the most customers? Everybody's lunch hours. People are actually taking the train to go have lunch. What is your busiest day of the week? I talked about this at the start. It's Saturday. And when you think about driving to the mall on Saturday versus taking transit, if you can get there and it's convenient, people will do it. What operational changes have you made? Most people have added new, new staff to their businesses to deal with the uptick that the streetcar has created. And we, this is unfortunately, won't be, you won't hear it, but it was a survey where they actually interview all of the businesses along the street, or many of them, to talk about what they've experienced, and it's very positive. It's so positive, they're now trying to float bonds to extend it. Now, I'm going to change topics a little bit, and I want you to think about this. Uh, a former federal uh, member of parliament here, etc. This is something you as a community should start thinking about. And it's an election, right? Good time to have it. And it's about value capture. And I can tell you that in the United States, when you build a transit line, and so this is Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is a square. This is Maryland over on this side. I worked in here. And the red line subway came down and went into my two legs of it, came in. And I've been working to join a 16-mile corridor for a new, what's called, Purple Line streetcar. And one of the ways you look at paying for this is you say, okay, if I build that train, and pretend that's here in Ontario, how much revenue will I generate by people investing in new businesses on either side of the corridor? In this case, half a mile. And can I capture that increase? Now, in the States, value capture, you can capture all kinds of stuff, as I'll show you in a moment. But here's that example. Of, what intersection is this on here in Ontario? I forgot. We drove by Courtney, it this morning. Uh, Courtney Park? Courtney, Courtney Park. Park. And you look at Courtney Park. You put the train in tomorrow, and then all of a sudden, whoever built that decides to do it over here. If you look at what that property is paying in property tax today, it's a lot less than what they'll be paying when they build that building. Value capture says you capture that increase in that area and can you use that money to invest in your community where you've done the change to build new infrastructure, to build affordable housing, etc. And I'll show you the difference it makes. So you've got these stations and that's what they look like today. I can tell you that in the States, pretend that's there, 
I could capture land transfer fees. You pay a land transfer fee in Ontario, I believe, right? When I sold my house in Washington, D.C., I paid $17,500 on a house that was worth six hundred. dollars We could capture that. We could capture building permit fees, impact fees, development application fees, and other things in the states that you can't do here, but you have these tools here. You have those fees, and you could, ca you could capture them. In fact, we worked out that the Missouri government share of the tax increment in different scenarios of charging them, we charge, and we do do this here in, in Ontario and Canada, you have a special assessment revenue of, in this case, on uh, in scenario D, we would charge five cents for every hundred dollars of valuation of property tax. Commercial as well, and we do this in, uh, certainly did this in Toronto, I assume you do it in Mississauga, for every unit that gets built, you pay a fee. If you start getting all those fees, we worked out that where we were working in the States on that one line, it would generate $100 million a year. And that was more than enough to pay for the operating and help subsidize the cost of the bonds to build it. So when we start thinking about changes in policy in Canada, we have to have start having these conversations about allowing municipalities who are investing in these, these things and accepting these density targets to collect some of the revenue that's generated to help pay for the things that the community needs. Now, a little hard to see from back there, but it's very important to remember average tax yield by property tax. You get your property tax that says your house is worth 600,000. You actually pay 3,000. But the valuation is 600,000. That's what this is about. And when you look at the different types of land uses, downtown office buildings are off the charts because they're valued way higher. Farmland, not so much. Single family houses, not so much. It's retail office, multifamily high rise, and mixed uses, and downtown offices. That's what pays the big bucks. So when you start to get this new development along the corridor, you're looking at those increases in tax revenues. You should be having a dialogue about what you want to do with that money. So for example, in many communities, they use it for affordable housing. They use it for business stabilization for both new and don't forget the existing businesses which I'm sure why many of you are here, and new infrastructure to enable people to get to those businesses. Now I'll give you an example, and this is in Washington, D.C. This is the new streetcar on H Street. Now some people may be concerned about gentrification, about the displacement of existing businesses. I can tell you that where this is done, it's really site-specific. In the case of H Street, which is a very busy place now where they put the train, yes, they've got some new construction, but it brought the first full service grocery store in the community in decades. So there was a positive. And it's brought enough traffic in that in the lower, smaller business area, the businesses are seeing an increase in their business. It's very, very important. Now, remember that here, Ontario is not Queen Street West. When I was the planner for downtown Toronto for 21 years, the changes I saw on Queen Street West were dramatic. And it happened because Club Monaco, do you remember Club Monaco? They, still, they don't exist anymore, right? Club Monaco built a new building next to the used bookstore by the Atlas Machinery Tool Company, which is still there, actually. I used to get my rudder bits there. Club Monaco built their new building, and the place just took off. And there was retail upscaling. Businesses moved. You're not Queen Street West. The wonderful thing about here, Ontario, is there is a lot of land. And what you'll see is a strengthening of the existing businesses and the ability, given the size of the lots, as I'll show you in a moment, to do new construction while keeping the old businesses. This is in Maryland, where I work. There's a subway <laughs> stop right there. And it's one of the highest retailing areas in the country per square foot. And this is a six-lane road that makes like, here, Ontario, look like a Sunday drive. It's a busy place. Going back to what I said about changing the land use regulations, we changed all the land use regulations down here and all these high-end shopping malls are now tearing themselves down around the edges and building in the parking lots and maintaining the uses behind them and putting the parking in, in the buildings that they're building. So the new businesses are staying and they're maximizing all the vacant land. Just as a side note, that's Lord and Taylor. The people who own the mall own the Washington Nationals baseball team. <laughs> Lord and Taylor, or is it, no, it's Lord and Taylor, is suing the mall owner for $2 billion because they've taken down most of the mall and they're saying, you're ruining our brand. So there's little asides. 
But the beautiful part, and this could be here on Ontario Street, is you have all this land to develop while still maintaining a revenue base with your existing businesses. And that's critical. And so what's happening along that corridor, and here's an example, that's what's happening. It's being built today. And we created a special taxing district. We're using the money from that special taxing district for the levies and impact fees for the development to pay for the infrastructure that's needed in the area to build a new downtown. Now, some of you may have asked, and I don't know if this debate's come up, about the impact of transit and what will lift and Uber do and autonomous vehicles to transit. Certainly there's a number of cities in the United States that have experienced a transit use reduction in the last two years, largely a function of the price of gas. And you're still going to need ride sharing, you're still going to need parking spaces, and you're still going to need transit. And the cities that will succeed in the future are the ones that have the transit. So, that said, Here's, I'll let, as I conclude, I'll play this video. Kansas City did it right. This is a rapper who does a rapper video on the Kansas City streetcar. And if you ever want to, you should hear this guy, he's fantastic. Uh, you can go on YouTube and hit KC Rap. It actually looks like K Crap, but it's KC Rap. Um, and these guys, these guys are not workers, they're gonna start dancing in a minute. But there's plenty of examples. And you can create a Mississauga Brampton solution. You're not Toronto, you're not Calgary, you're not Vancouver, and that's a good thing. It's actually a really good thing. You have a blank slate with a lot of people vested in, the, in their businesses and in their, uh, their homes who I'm sure that you can work with to really make this succeed. And in my drive this morning, I wasn't sure if I should say, I guarantee you that we'll come back here in 25 years and you're actually going to see it extended because people will see the value of it. And I'm really excited for you. I just think that you have an opportunity here that's gonna be unbelievable. So thank you very much. And now, Darjit is gonna come up. He's already been introduced. And I will get his PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. I hope. Oh, come back. Yeah, that's exactly what it's supposed to do. All right, thank you. I don't think I can be as engaging as Roland, but uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Roland for coming all the way from Calgary and sharing his invaluable experiences. Uh, I think it's crucial for us as we're embarking on the city building initiative that we learn from others and take account of those lessons into our approach. Uh, objective at the end, as Roland's presentation uh, identified, is communication has to be there. We have to hear what your concerns are during construction and take all steps that we reasonably can to address it. Uh, I would also say that construction will be disruptive. I mean, there's no way around it. Um, so working with you as our partners is the only way we can try to mitigate those impacts. And there has to be a reasonable compromise. Uh, with that in mind, my presentation isn't really on why light rail is needed. It's more on our communications and outreach plan, uh, what we have done to date, what we will continue to do to ensure that we're engaging you and we're hearing you and trying to modify our approach to ensure that we're working as partners. Uh, sure, my apologies. For those who may not, the, may not know the project, just quickly, I, I don't want to bore you with this, but it's a 20 kilometer system with 22 stops starting at Port Credit at the South End and Steels at North. Uh, the capital investment in the project will be paid by the province and they have committed to $1.4 billion in funding. The project right now is in procurement. It is being delivered as a P3, so a public-private partnership. The idea is we would hire a contractor, which is a consortium, many firms working together with different skill sets. Uh, they will design it, build it, operate it, and maintain it uh, for 30 years. However, the fares, the revenues, the schedule service will all be within uh, our control, uh, working with the cities. Uh, right now, the timelines are such that we're expecting to award the contract in winter of 2018. Based on the work we have done to date, we expect the project will be in service by 2022, end of 2022. By, by in service, I mean uh, the trains will be running. The train that will be running is being produced by Alstom. You probably would have seen the announcement yesterday by the minister that uh, Alstom is uh, opening a facility in Brampton. Uh, basically, they'll be assembling these vehicles for our project as well as the Finch light rail project and any future projects that may come through the province or by municipalities. 
So it's actually a pretty good step because hundreds of jobs are being created in this niche market, which isn't common to Mississauga and Brampton. In terms of our communication and outreach plan, I mean, there are really three fundamental pillars here. You have the first basic step of engagement. Uh, we have taken a number of initiatives on this uh, front. As you'll notice, we have, and you may have met them uh, over the last uh, few months, we have uh, community connectors. Basically, the concept is simple. We have a very strong team of uh, knowledgeable individuals on the project uh, who are bilingual, uh, I shouldn't say bilingual, they're multilingual, uh, representing the diversity of the region. And the objective is go speak to every resident, every business owner along the line, understand what their concerns are, inform them of the project, and by concerns, I don't mean general concerns. The objective is really to focus on how construction may impact them, what are their limitations, and then look for ways of how we can uh, assist, assist them. So, so simple things like some businesses don't have any social media uh, exposure. They don't have websites. They don't have Facebook. They don't have Instagram. They don't have Twitter. So our objective is to facilitate that so they can actually uh, expose their business to a uh, bigger audience. The other step we have taken is corridor committees. So we have about five of them spread from north to south. The objective is that we have a small group of representatives who at the grassroots level uh, understand the local residents, the businesses, as well as institutions in some instances. They, they're influencers at that level. So we want to be basically um, look for another way to outreach to the community that may not be along the corridor, but uh, be part of the greater community. And the third piece is obviously you know, the public information centers like uh, uh, events like today as well as PICs, PCCs, events. We attended over 50 last year. Intent is to go to even more this year and continue that over the next four or five years as, as long as the construction remains. Again, objective simple. We want people to know what the project is. We want to hear what people, uh, what their concerns are and see how we can modify our approach as we progress. This is just an example of the stop, uh, typical stop. This is at Britannia. Uh, it's a pretty wide corridor today at Britannia, but we will have a stop in the center median uh, with access at a sign signalized intersection. Continuing with my thought on the outreach plan, the next step after you've engaged people is obviously how do you support them? So, and, and, and in my view, this isn't just an effort by Metrolinx and the city. Um, I want the consortium that is going to be managing the construction to be at the forefront of it. So we have provisions within our contract asking them to do a number of things so that you know they can be there alongside with us and the, CIA, uh, and the city as well as the BIAs to ensure that the businesses are being heard and their concerns addressed through their means and methods of construction. I'll give you a simple example which in my experience at Waterloo was a very good uh, initiative which is hosting trade shows. So after we award the contract and there's this multinational uh, con uh, consortium is there, they may not necessarily have all the subcontractors and all the service providers identified. We want them to invest locally. So what happens in a trade show is companies uh, that are local here can offer services that the proponents or the contractor may not be aware of. You can imagine during four or five years of construction, they're gonna have hundreds of crews. They're gonna need food, accommodation, transportation. So we can have plans and we can have policies and we can work with the businesses to have programs where they are providing rebates, they have special programs for, for lunch, dinner, breakfast. We can be working with local transportation companies uh, to move people who are coming and going out. Uh, they will be procuring or leasing a lot of vehicles locally, which will have to be maintained. They will also be procuring a lot of equipment locally, which will have to be maintained. Uh, there could be services like printing. A lot of paper is used on these projects. A lot of drawings get printed, so they need those services. They need catering services. Uh, they even need support from our local real estate industry to help uh, them lease uh, parcels of land for staging, uh, which is basically uh, hoarding for uh, storing equipment, storing materials. They will need support locally for people who provide landscaping services, rental of fences. They will need support on uh, local services that offer trucking to haul soil, uh, local uh, contractors that offer asphalt, concrete. So they're looking for all of those services. Even if they have those contracts signed, they're always looking for the best deal. So the trade show allows them to be exposed to all these local services that they may never actually ever have the uh, opportunity to do so. So we're looking for that, and I, I'm hoping that we can do that not just at the start of the project, but actually do it uh, at some regular interval throughout the project so smaller businesses can actually go have their 15 minutes in front of these uh, multinational firms and be able to uh, you know, basically do their sales pitch and hopefully good, 
uh, solutions will come out of that. This is just an example of a form from our uh, current project on Eglinton Crosstown where these are sort of steps we have taken to assist the businesses. There's advertising, there's signage, there's printing. And then there are events, uh, and uh, as Roland uh, mentioned, Kansas did a lot of those, and we expect the same. My objective is that public should know that despite construction occurring, businesses are open. That, you know, that there are programs, and we work with you guys to look at how we can entice them to actually come to the corridor uh, throughout the week as well as, as, well as on weekends, uh, whether construction is there or not. We did that very successfully in Waterloo. Uh, even, uh, I'll give you an example, basically a, a local theater had popped up during construction um, in, in downtown Kitchener, so one way we wanted to entice people to come to that business was we actually on a Saturday closed off an area and they presented a movie to families for free out in the open. Yes, it's a construction site, but if you can work with your business partners, you can actually do certain things that they themselves may not actually think of. So that's the type of uh, partnership we're looking for as we progress with the project. Sorry, my apologies. And one, I would say the last piece of uh, our plan, and it's an extension of all the things that uh, I've just mentioned, is community benefits. Again, the focus is we want our contractors, our future uh, partners who will operate uh, this project to invest locally. We want them to work with the local workforce agencies to look for how they can engage the local technical know-how here, hire them, whether that's for operations, maintenance, or construction of the system. We want to have their focus on the youth. So we have, we have language in our contract where they are required to have apprenticeship programs. So we're working with our local colleges right now to see, okay, these are the sort of skill sets that they will need. You should look at programs that can be offered now before the contract's awarded so the youth that are uh, looking for this opportunity can actually make, uh, can, can be facilitated in uh, uh, you know, availing those opportunities. And then the third piece is there are certain groups that may feel uh, uh, that they're disenfranchised or they're just historically disadvantaged. So we want to make sure that the consortium uh, actually looks out for those groups and actually uh, pursues options with them. So we, the whole objective of this at the end of it is that we want to engage you, we want to be, be partners with you, and you know this is not a this is not just a relationship over a year. We're, we're going to be here for five years, four or five years, and then there's a 30-year concession thereafter. So we want to make sure that there's a good, healthy relationship between the businesses, the residents, and the operator of the system in the future. That's really the end of my presentation. Uh, this is just an example of the yard that will be built at 407 in Hull, Ontario. This is where the system will be operated and maintained from. Uh, they will be housing at least 100 or 200 people at this location. Again, our aim will be through our contract that they hire individuals from the local market. Uh, so for instance, the drivers, they're not going to bring them from abroad. Uh, they will be looking at local bus drivers to fill those positions. Uh, they will be looking for people who can maintain light rails and with Alstom opening its facility here, yes it won't happen overnight, but within a few years there will be enough of a market where people would have gained those skill sets from uh, that facility to actually uh, provide support at this location. There will be maintenance services provided through this facility which are common to the local trades that are already here. So again, the objective is that we look at all options that are on the table to ensure that the benefit isn't uh, to the companies that goes outside, it's actually locally distributed to the businesses. Um, that's the conclusion of my presentation and I'm, I think we're willing to take questions. Thank you. So my name is Christy, I'm with the Brampton Board of Trade and um, I think we have a lot to look forward to. Um, you know, when we look five, ten years out and we think of the potential that the LRT has and the business it's going to bring to our community, I think we have a lot to get excited about. So while I am asking uh, Roland to come on back up, and you can bring the microphone with you there. If you have written down any questions on your piece of paper, you can feel free to hand them to Jody. Just put your arm up and she'll do her best to come and see you there. Personally, I have to say that I'm quite excited about, uh, I've got a couple of kids and the fact that in a couple, few years when I'm old enough, or when they're old enough that I'm happy to let them just hop on the LRT, they'll be able to take it down to square one. They'll be able to, you know, hop on it to go to school and I think that's a really exciting opportunity for us. Um, and when I look at that number of, in Kansas City, there were zero businesses lost during construction. I really hope that in five years, in 10 years, when Roland's giving another presentation, 
in a different city, we'll be able to say in Brampton, Mississauga, there were zero businesses lost, and we'll, we'll be the next stat that's up there. And we'll so. be using the examples that Dodge Creek showed today. Exactly. And I think we can look forward to that. So, Is our, this where we sing feelings? <laughs> uh, yeah, Carrie Ogre, there's a question right back there. Jody, if you don't mind picking that one up. So I've got a few questions here. If you um, we don't have information from the proponents who are bidding on the project in terms of how they would approach it. We have our own thoughts on this. Uh, typically, contractors look at the most challenging areas first because they want to make sure anything that's long lead item is addressed first. So right now for us, Port Credit, Cooksville area is probably one of the most congested in terms of utilities that are very old. They will also then look at the structures that need to be replaced. So as you know, we have interfaces with MTO. There's QW 403, 407, 401. And we have two rail uh, bridges that we have to uh, tackle. There's the Lakeshore line and then there's a the Milton line. So they will definitely be focused on the south end uh, as to begin with. They will start at the yard because this is their uh, basically base of operations. So they want to make sure that that facility is done as soon as it can be. And they may also be looking at the north end. I mean, Steels uh, is a very uh, wide and uh, pretty large intersection, a lot of deep utilities there. So their focus will go where the deep utilities are first, where the oldest utilities are, and where the old infrastructure like bridges are so that they can actually start that work up front. <coughs> How much they can do each month, each week, uh, it's hard to say at this point. We will have that information once the bids have come in. Uh, so I don't want to speculate here that uh, each block will be done so many months. The reality is the first step of this construction is replacing utilities. So as, as much as it is a transit project, the, the first step of it is replacing all the existing infrastructure and, and renewing it. So they will be digging down deep, repla replacing or relocating utilities, bringing the road back up, the road will be serviceable at that stage, it just won't be finished. And then they'll start working in the middle of it where the tracks are, and then they'll do electrification at the end. And then they'll run the trains for a while before they actually have the system open. Uh, that's at a high level, but so uh, it's hard to say how long they will be in any, any block until we actually have uh, a team on board. And I think that if anyone who's ever experienced any kind of construction or renovation knows that there are often surprises. Yes. And uh, we may find some of those as well. Yeah, in uh, Waterloo, <laughs> we were surprised that uh, we found Corduroy Road. Um, you know, this was from 1846. It's, it's of an archaeological value. So we had to stop construction for a while in that area, and we had to follow Ministry of Environment process to make sure that we protect that heritage piece. We actually made a, uh, a good community uh, event out of it uh, because at the end of the day, the corridor road itself did not need to be protected. We just had to document it and pull it out. We actually cut it in pieces as, pe you know, as part of heritage and we gave it to the public for free. We had lineups of people at our facilities two in the morning to be able to come and say this was, you know, this was how the community was established and they wanted a piece of it. So sometimes even when you're hit by a challenge, you can turn it into something positive. So. Another question here, uh, how will the LRT be integrated with uh, Mississauga and Brampton Transit? So right now it will be fully integrated. It will have interface at uh, uh, Lakeshore West, uh, uh, the Milton Line, at the Mississauga Transit Way in, on Rathburn. Uh, all the bus stops are going to continue, majority of them where they are today. The service may mod be modified by the cities. And uh, we're making sure that the fare integration, is, which is a key component of it, is there. So if you have a transfer from Brampton and you want to get into Mississauga on the light rail, the expectation is not that you pay an incremental or a new fee for that. You should be able to transfer. Like vice versa, if you get off transit on light rail and you want to get onto the bus system, you shouldn't have to pay a different fee. You should be able to travel between the two cities and light rail at no additional cost than the normal fare that you would pay to, uh, at that point when the system is running. And I'll just point out that's a big bonus because in places like Washington, you have a fare card, you tap it to get on the subway, you tap it to get on the regional bus. It's, it, it, it's, that's a real bonus. Okay, I've got a few questions here and it's, uh, you can both probably address them, but some safety concerns. One with um, uh, the station being in the middle of the street, so uh, pedestrian crossing. Also accessibility yeah. um, for anyone who has any um, physical disabilities to be able to get on and off, um, elevator service if necessary, that sort of thing. And maybe, Roland, you can talk a little bit about what you've seen happen in other cities and sure. Rushpreet, you can address what the plans are for here. Yeah, certainly putting the, the train down the middle of the road is the least disruptive to your businesses, etc. 
and as you heard in your presentation, the signalization, etc., it's done all over the place. It's not a problem, and they're all accessible. Yeah, and I'll just add to it, each stop is, a, a, is at a signalized intersection. So it's not that we're asking people to cross mid-block to get to a platform. You will have your crosswalk, and you will, pro you will come from the eastbound or the westbound to the center of the road, and then you will have a path that will take you uh, to the platform. The vehicles and the platform, everything is very accessible these days. These vehicles are 70% uh, low floor. Basically, the, idea, the concept is that when you're at a platform and the vehicle comes by, there's no lip. You don't have to step up or step down to enter into a vehicle. It's actually a pretty smooth transition. So if you have a buggy or you're in a wheelchair, it's, it's a very nice smooth transition in and out of the vehicle. And the platforms themselves, although there may be a slight ramp, they're all designed to keep accessibility in mind. So if, uh, if I have a visual uh, disability, uh, then there are markers on the ground. Uh, these are protrusions mm -hmm. where uh, through the use of a stick, I know where I have to be guided if I want to get into a vehicle. Uh, I also have audible signs, uh, audible sounds, so that they know a vehicle has come and it's on the right side or the left side, and this is how I can enter. So there are many provisions provided within the infrastructure to ensure that, r irrespective of your mobility issue, you can actually use that uh, facility without having a lot of uh, inconveniences. But be diligent as the properties develop along the, the route. Make sure that the public infrastructure in front of those developments. Also, meets, it, yes. It's got to be fit into the same vein so that it's mm -hmm. seamless as you move into the transit yeah. system. Yeah, that's great. And then what can be anticipated in terms of loss of services, whether it's internet, electricity, water? Like with, like with any other construction, there will be some uh, interruptions. Again, it's hard to see at this point. Uh, once we have a contractor on board and we have a good idea of their staging and their construction progress, we will be going out to the public. So it won't be just, well, tomorrow our crews will be here. Our objective is to make sure we communicate throughout. So before construction even starts, we'll be identifying, you know, within a few months, expect this sort of work to happen in this area. And then as we get closer, you'll have more notifications giving you more details that the blockage is from here to here. Uh, your service may be out for 24 hours or four hours or two hours on this date. So. Uh, unlike other projects, our objective is to inform you very early on and then actually pr provide more and more details as we get closer to that construction time period so that you're well aware that this is how I, you may need to change your day or your priorities uh, to accommodate that. Again, like I said, it's a, it's a compromise. There will never, we won't be perfect and uh, you know, we will expect some patience from you, but as long as there's good communication between us and the businesses and the residents, I, I'm pretty confident that we'll actually successfully deliver this. And, and keep the long game in mind because you're lucky. You're getting your deep utilities upgraded. Yes. And that's a major bonus that a lot of people would actually wish would happen in their community. Yeah, and we're, we've been planning for this, uh, and the cities have been planning even before us for almost six, seven years. So a lot of those utilities have been fully engaged and they recognize the benefit they also are getting from this project. You had mentioned one of the community groups where uh, you've been able to gather some input. Yeah. Is there an opportunity for those in our audience to uh, join in with uh, those groups and committees? Definitely they can make a recommendation. I, I, I don't know the process, I'll be honest. Uh, I do attend them and we have that dialogue, but we do have some terms and conditions. But I don't think anything is precluded, precluded from making a suggestion and saying, you know, this individual or these individuals may benefit. You may benefit from having them as part of the group. Uh, so by all means, uh, if there's a recommendation, we'll definitely take that into consideration. Excellent. So what I've heard very loud and clear is that communication is going to be key yes. in this process. I'm hearing possibly some short-term pain, but the yes. long-term gain will very much be worth it. And I said we will be one of those cities that, I said Roland will in a few years, be able to show slides of you know, the Hero Ontario LRT corridor and be able to say that you know, we successfully built 20 kilometers of LRT with zero businesses closing. I'll give you an anecdotal uh, example from Waterloo. We have an intersection there, King of Victoria, that's where the, uh, that's close to the existing uh, GO terminal. Before construction started, there were a lot of derelict buildings that used to be tannery uh, buildings in the past, and they were going for less than a million dollars. By the time the construction started, we already had $350 million of investment just in that one intersection. It won't happen at every intersection, but it just shows the potential that's there. And uh, surprisingly, that one building that uh, uh, was at the corner there, it was worth less than half a million dollars before the project and it sold over 60 after construction started. So you can see, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, I mean uh, to Roland's point, I mean, there is huge potential for growth. Uh, and, you know, once there's one investment, then there are others who look for it like, well, 
if 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 so and so is willing to put twenty five million dollars for twenty five million dollar down for a condo, then I can bring my funds in too. So it's it's actually really a good opportunity for businesses to make use of that momentum and not just think of it as a, a, a loss during construction. And I can't stress enough with the last pictures I showed, to your point, that with the, the malls that you have, you can redevelop and keep the businesses going. And that's a huge bonus that, that, that you can't get in like downtown Waterloo or downtown Toronto, which is why the doors are so wide open for you with this investment. Excellent. So I do want to say thank you to both of you for coming. I'm going to try to be conscious of the time. Um, I'm on a very strict schedule. Jody's giving me the nod over here. So I do want to say thank you very much to both of you. One more question. How do we make sure that we are staying as up to date as possible on these developments? Where is the best place to check? So we have provided information. I'm, I'm sure that our team uh, at the back can provide that. But uh, we have a web page. We have a call line. We have emails. And as I said, we have community connectors. So these folks will will be traveling this corridor very often. And you will, you'll get to see them. And we will have a storefront. Uh, which we're hoping, which we're hoping we can open in the next few months. So this will be uh, pretty much all working hours in a day, and uh, some working hours on a weekend. So if you don't have the opportunity to send an email, you can always walk into the store and say, "This is my concern, or this is what I want to know," and people, people there will be able to facilitate that. Excellent. I also want to make sure that you are marking April 24th on your calendar. There are flyers on your table. So that is the next session in our um, business preparation series, talking about how to um, maintain your customers during times of business disruption, because it is going to be disruptive. Uh, how do we make sure that we're continuing those relationships so we do end up with all of the businesses along the corridor staying open? So hopefully we will see you on April 24th, and we will make sure to keep you as up to date as possible. So please join me in saying thank you to both Roland and to Darsh Pri for coming today. There you go. And I just want to say thank you to Jody and to the team at the Mississauga Board of Trade as well. So thank you for joining us, and we'll see you on the 24th.